for um, allow, thank you to the conference organizers for uh, allowing my colleague Jules Maglova and I to present some of the work that we've been doing looking at um, school um, education reform and uh, language change, particularly in Almaty, but broader, more broadly in Kazakhstan. Um, so today, in our paper, we talk more about the theoretical aspects of some of our work, but uh, for, for, for the sake of discussion, uh, I'll present some of the um, project findings um, and then some of the questions that our project raises. Uh, so this project initially was funded by the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs. Uh, we collected the data in 2014. It was a part of a grant uh, funding uh, researchers from throughout South, uh, the South Caucasus and uh, Central Asia. So we were the team representing Kazakhstan. Um, and our aim was really generally to look at um, what are the different um, socioeconomic uh, and different factors that are affecting education stratification, particularly in urban Kazakhstan. Uh, we, we chose Almaty because we work there, so it's convenient, uh, but also because it is the biggest city, it's the biggest school district, and so to look at the challenges facing the Almaty school district would um, help us get a sense of kind of the broader challenges facing the education system in the country. Um, and so just to provide some background about the project, uh, we conducted a survey uh, in seven, so at the time, uh, seven rayons in Almaty, uh, we uh, surveyed four schools in each rayon and five, uh, a fifth school in a, a different rayon. Uh, we passed out 2,954 uh, surveys, or those were the usable surveys that we uh, received. Um, the surveys were conducted both in Russian and in, in Kazakh, and we had a representative sample of uh, both Kazakh and Russian classes. And so um, our sample is pretty representative, or we tried to get a pretty even sample among the different language classrooms. Uh, this is just to give a sense. Um, so the, the survey actually was much more extensive than just covering language and education. We also wanted to look at, um, you know, students' access to schools, which I'll briefly talk about today. We wanted to look at um, students' uh, family backgrounds, uh, their parents' education, um, and a whole kind of range of different issues. And so in total, uh, we had about 71 different kind of like variables that we were looking at. Um, and today I'll just focus on the language aspect, mostly. So uh, just to kind of briefly, so I, I don't think that uh, I need to kind of reiterate the Kazakhstani language policy since it's been mentioned a number of times today. Um, but one of the kind of the, the broader statistics is that, uh, that that's often used to show that uh, the Kazakh language is uh, being revitalized, etc., is that there has been a decrease in the number of Russian language schools and there is an increase in Kazakh language schools. Um, so that's a statistic that's widely used. Um, however, one of the things that we, when we looked at kind of the statistics across the board, uh, while there is a decrease, a slight decrease in the, uh, the number of Russian language schools, um, there hasn't been much of a change in the total demand for Russian language education. So the number of schools has decreased slightly, uh, and the number of students in Kazakh language schools has increased, but the number of students enrolled in Russian language schools has pretty much stayed the same. Now this actually for us raised a number of questions because if you have fewer schools but the same amount of demand, then this kind of assumes that you, I mean this kind of leads us to think that um, school, Russian language schools, the classes must be, lar the class sizes must be larger um, or over enrolled um, and um, the Kazakh language schools, we weren't really sure what was going on. Um, and sure enough, when we looked at our survey data as well as an OECD report that came out in 2014, um, Kazakh language schools tended to be, the class sizes tended to be much smaller. On average, uh, particularly outside of, like further out of the city, the class sizes are about 15 students per class. And this is for public, this is for public schools, um, uh, public schools up to compulsory education, so up to uh, grade 11. Now schools in the urban center tended to be much bigger, so on average it would be 25. Um, but in reality, when you look at, um, uh, when you visit some of the urban uh, classrooms, you can have anywhere from like 30 to 60 students, particularly at the younger grades, in Russian language classrooms. And so these classes are, are, are like definitely over-enrolled, 
which has implications for students' learning, uh, the quality of education, etc. And yet, um, you know, there is a, there's still a high demand for Russian language education because of um, the different kind of prestige that's affiliated with that, with the, the, the idea that Russian language provides access to different um, opportunities in the future, etc. And so this is just kind of one of the general statistics that kind of uh, raised some questions for us more broadly. Um, in our actual survey, what was really interesting to find was that um, among the Kazakh, in the Kazakh classes that we surveyed, 98% of the students in Kazakh um, classes were ethnically Kazakh. Now this was in sharp contrast to students in the Russian language classrooms, uh, which were about 50% ethnic Kazakh and 50% something else, like Russian, Korean, Uyghur, etc. And so this also kind of, when we looked at, I mean, this is a very stark picture uh, when you kind of compare the two different types of classrooms. Uh, in the one case, you have um, a Kazakh medium of instruction schools that are basically homogenous, um, mostly ethnic Kazakhs um, from kind of one ethnic population. And then you have Russian medium of instruction schools that um, have a much more diverse student body. Uh, for us, I, while we haven't kind of like Followed up with it, I and mean, we're following up with this right now. And my colleague will talk about this tomorrow. But this does raise a lot of questions in our mind about issues of inclusion and diversity. How can um, students be exposed to diversity if one type of school is uh, much more diverse in terms of uh, not only socioeconomic background but also in terms of culture, um, linguistic resources, etc. And then when another type of school is predominantly of, of one ethnicity. So. Um, while we haven't kind of pushed this uh, much further than our finding, it did raise some concerns uh, in terms of thinking about broader issues of social inclusion um, and diversity, particularly thinking kind of uh, more longer term. Um, not only were the, the schools kind of ethnically, the, the ethnic makeup of, uh, the nationality makeup of the schools uh, very different, uh, but also the kind of the socio-demographic background of the schools were also different. So what we noticed was that in the Kazakh medium of instruction schools, um, these schools had a greater proportion, of, a greater percentage of students um, who were not born in Almaty. Um, and then when you look at their, where their parents were born, their parents were um, also predominantly not born in Almaty. Um, and this is in contrast to students who were registered or enrolled at Russian medium of instruction schools, who over 60% were actually, um, you know, residents of Almaty, had been born in Almaty, etc. And so, um, while this doesn't raise an issue in terms of the quality of education, but this does kind of raise some issues about questions about, like, what is the broader social change that's taking place in Kazakhstan as a whole, and how do these processes of urbanization um, affect uh, you know, schools, uh, the staffing of schools, as well as, um, you know, the, the demographic and the makeup of the school population. Um, and so, just as a kind of, as a, as a side note, I think when we think about language policy, uh, you know, we tend to uh, focus on the policies themselves. How have the policies changed, etc.? But I think it's also really important to think about, um, you know, who is speaking what to, to whom, or and why are people choosing to go to different types of schools? Uh, because that kind of provides insight into um, kind of the language ideologies and the values that people are uh, holding uh, and that that are kind of like taking place inside us uh, in the in the broader society. Uh, it's, and uh, kind of. Briefly, kind of moving on to this kind of slightly adjacent uh, finding, another aspect we wanted to look at was um, not only like language of instruction, but also access. And so, one, another thing that we found was um, when when we were looking at like how what kind of access do students have, just even physically. Um, so, 33 percent of the students in our survey actually did not live uh, reported not living in their Propitska district. And so 33% of the students were going to school that they were uh, technically not supposed to be going to, which actually was a really surprising statistic for us because, I mean, we thought that maybe there would be like, you know, a handful of students in each district that would go, choose to somehow go to better schools or other schools. Uh, but to find that 33% of our whole survey population um, wasn't actually going to the schools that they were supposed to go to uh, raised some interesting kind of red flags in our mind as well. 
Um, in addition to that, uh, another 8% reported that they, they travel uh, more than 15 kilometers to get to school. Um, and this becomes kind of a little bit more significant uh, when looking at our next slide. Uh, so just to provide a picture of what we're talking about, um, on, on my right side, um, the red box in the middle kind of outlines the historic city center of Almaty, uh, which, where, uh, which is where some of the oldest schools are located. On my left side, the red box um, outlines where uh, some of the newer, like the newer districts that have been created. Now, in this um, in in this visualization, um, what you can see is that we divided actually all the schools by um, we divided all the schools by district, and then all the schools by language, and also by type. So uh, it's like a gymnasium that's in Kazakh, a gymnasium that's in Russian. So we wanted to see what is the distribution of schools by language and by type throughout the city. And what we found was when you look at the top four, uh, top four school districts or rayons, you can see just even visually that there's more boxes, right? There's just more boxes and there's more gray. Um, what this kind of shows is that students that live in kind of the more historic city center area or the core parts of the city have access to a more a, a wider range of schools uh, that's in both language as well as in terms of school type. So the students have a wider range of access to school or gymnasiums, to lyceums, as well as um, to, uh, um, to colleges. If you notice this, the, the, um, this, the, the three uh, rayons at the bottom of the screen, which are in the newer districts, there's fewer options for students in these districts. Um, the majority of the schools are in, in Kazakh, and um, there's just a less, there's less of a variety in terms of the types of school, in terms of gymnasiums, etc. Now keeping in mind uh, the previous slide talking about access, uh, students um, driving or, or, or having to take travel for more than 15 kilometers to get to school, uh, students going to school outside of their Propitska district, uh, and then thinking about this slide in terms of the way that schools are distributed throughout the city, um, the way that the infrastructure itself is developing actually um, is, uh, is kind of a challenging um, thing that I think that, that needs to be addressed in terms of students having just even physical access to schools uh, for the sake of education equity. Um, this is kind of another way of looking at infrastructure issues. What we wanted to look at was, um, now going back to the, 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 the note that I had mentioned earlier about Russian medium schools being kind of privileged or kind of held as more, having more prestige, um, we wanted to see how are schools in terms of infrastructure distributed throughout the city. And so um, if you look at the top bar, again it's the city, uh, it's the rayons, it's listed by rayons, but then we wanted to look at uh, schools as they were established by time. And so you can kind of see in the highlighted green in the two, top two, which is the historic city center, again, um, the majority of the schools were created actually in the 1930s. And so the infrastructure that is in the city center and in the historic city, uh, historic part of the city, uh, is t tends to be older. Now when you look at these districts, which are newer, the infrastructure in terms of the, the, the development and the creation of schools kind of accelerates if you get to the late to the late 60s. Uh, and so for, again, for us it just kind of raises questions regarding um, what do we mean when we talk about school quality? Um, so when we were doing field work, one of the things that we kind of assumed was that more money would go to renovating and improving the, the infrastructure of schools that are in the city center because they are considered better schools um, by, by kind of general, the general population, etc. But it was really surprising. Um, so the, this, the, the picture on the right is a picture of a school that was that's actually a, a well-known school in the city center. The school on the left, which is a really, it's like a beautiful school, it's really new, like it's got all these new facilities, it is like in one of the far, like kind of uh, district, or far, it's, it's located very far actually, in one of the newer districts. And so again, it was kind of, it just really challenged our notions about um, quality of schooling, 
what is available for different types of students because we were thinking, okay, maybe there's less, uh, there are less resources that are being put into uh, schools that are on the outskirts versus schools that are on the, uh, in the historic city, city center. So actually kind of seeing some of these uh, pictures and uh, seeing kind of the schools that, the schools that the, the surveys were conducted in, it really challenged our notions about, uh, you know, what is happening on the ground in terms of like education and kind of infrastructure development. Um, and I guess uh, I mean just to kind of uh, just to kind of wrap up, um, our you know as we've been doing our research, like looking at um, the different challenges as well as the way that school education reform is taking place in Almaty, um, it's really challenged our kind of notions about how to maybe think more critically about education reform. Um, and so a lot of the research that we found is very descriptive, describing like these are the processes that are taking place uh, with, without necessarily uh, placing a critical eye. And what we wanted to, what we were kind of like uh, thinking through, um, this is a, definitely a work in progress, but what we have been trying to think through is this aspect of how do you theorize, how do you kind of place education reform in the context of broader social change? And so, um, you know, looking at um, looking at things like, um, uh, you know, how can we move away from this discourse about the collapse of the Soviet Union? Um, at what point is uh, post-Soviet, are we post-post-Soviet? You know, at what point do we start looking at the trajectories of education that, um, you know, different countries or even at the city level have um, taken and look at kind of the, the, the paths that they've taken uh, in terms of education reform and then look at, look, analyze it at that level. Um, and more lately, more recently, we've been looking at uh, not just looking at how language policy and edu education policy um, changes over time, which is oftentimes the way that uh, policy discussions are articulated, uh, but also looking at how do language and education policies change um, in space. And so what does this mean for uh, schools and the material reality of schools and school buildings and uh, lived, the lived experiences of teachers and students? And then what does that mean for broader social change uh, in kind of the, these, in these very dynamic contexts, uh, particularly in Central Asia? So I, we don't have any conclusions or recommendations really, but um, you know, it's a lot of questions that we've been kind of encountering as we've been doing our field work and research. And uh, my colleague will kind of provide um, some more insight in terms, of, in terms of some of the work that we've been doing more recently. But that's it. Thank you.